Welcome to this week in Missouri Politics from our studios at the University of Central Missouri in beautiful Warrensburg, Missouri. We are joined by Senator Mike Searboy from Lee Summit. Senator, thank you for making the trip over. I appreciate being asked to be on. So veto session happened. It did. It's always weird to me. The House works and goes over there and pushes papers around and overrides some vetoes and every year the appropriations chairman, well this year he let me tweet the quote, we're not going to do that. But right. they did it anyway and you guys did the traditional thing, you do roll your eyes. Why do they do that? Well, I think it lets people, because some, some of the items that the governor vetoed were, were popular, and, and so I think a lot of the members in the House wanted to be on record voting in favor of it again. When I was floor leader, if you remember, we had uh, Governor Nixon, so the dynamics a were, were a lot different. Yeah, we overrode him a couple dozen times in 16, I think he 17. set some kind of record or something. I think yeah. we did. But again, that was with the Democratic governor, so there's a lot more uh, working with the Senate and getting things through. A little more meat on the bone there. Yeah. So it was odd. I, uh, I sat and watched session this week. The senators that voted against the budget bills were complaining that there wasn't enough spending. They, I think they wanted some spending targeted for their districts, essentially, and some highway patrol stuff. But it was kind of odd. The folks that thought the budget was too big were saying that you should, they disagree with Governor Parson cutting it. That would be an interesting thing to go back in history, see how often somebody at veto session has argued to override a veto on a bill they voted against. It's, pretty, it, it's kind of a unique approach. Yeah, and it didn't go very far. It did not. So, what do you think? I mean, the, obviously, there was it's the 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 budget sponsor, the mm -hmm. budget chairman, is the one that has to bring this up. The appropriations chairman was Dan Hageman. Now it's Senator Lincoln Huff. Mm -hmm. Do you, you agree with their stance of not going to those? Yes, I do. I, I, the governor vetoed a couple of things that I had put in the budget for part of my district, and but as the governor pointed out, there's other ways to go about that. Better, probably better ways. And so, yeah, I support. Uh, I thought Lincoln made a good decision. I mean, at the end of the day, right? It sure looked to me like when he vetoed all the St. Charles County stuff, St. Charles County guys were never going to let anybody else get one if they didn't get one, and it didn't seem like they were ever going to get one. Probably not, and I didn't really look <laughs> at St. Charles that closely, but yeah, there was some, I know there were some items in the budget from there, and I'm sure they were perturbed by that, but I, I think there's next year, uh, the money is not going to be quite as, as uh, easily to secure, but there's still money there, so if, if they want to take another run at it, I'm sure they can. Let's talk about two issues that I've watched. Um, bubble along and then I've watched you get involved in and they've changed. Let's start with the landfill. Mm -hmm. There's a landfill going to be built, uh, scheduled to be built somewhere mm -hmm. in the extreme southern Jackson County, right on the Cass County line. Mm -hmm. Not quite your district, but but not far as the crow flies from your district. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like in the interim you've stepped up and kind of taken the leadership role in this. Why'd you choose to do that? I've heard from a lot of people in my district because it really does impact my district on the on the southwest edge there. And uh, I've learned a lot about it, and it's really, really a bad idea for that area. Um, I, I, I'm a big believer in property rights, but the people that live there have property rights too. And if you're putting a power line or a street through an area, we have rules about eminent domain. And we've changed them in the last couple of years, so you get twice the assessed value now for your property on eminent domain. This landfill's going in there, and, and the threat is you sell it to us now or it'll be worth even less in the future. It's the opposite of eminent domain. They're gonna pay you less. And people, there's a lot of people out there, five, six hundred thousand dollar homes, middle class people, most of their net worth is in their home. It's down 15% now and in five years it'll be worth down another 15 or 20%. So when you talk about property rights, there's two sides of that coin. The people that are trying to build a landfill have property rights, but the people that live there and have lived there for decades, I think their property rights are stronger and you say, well, we're picking winners and losers. We're telling people what we can do with the property. They've got to change zoning out there to get a landfill in there. The, right now, it's zoned for residential. And so, um, well, if, but if, it, for a second. if it's got to be rezoned, isn't that a local matter? It's a Kansas City matter. And, that's, and I don't know where Kansas City is. I haven't got a good read on Kansas City yet on what their thoughts are on this landfill. Because quite honestly, I've, I've looked into this some now. Mark is the Mid-America Regional Council for the area. That's who should be leading this issue if our region needs a landfill. And Mark says we don't need one. And so we've got enough landfill space for 35 years. And so we don't need a landfill right now. We have transfer stations. We have uh, landfills in Johnson County. We have them in, out in Sedalia. We've still got one up north by Liberty. There's still plenty of space in those landfills. So this uh, is a bad fit. It's a bad timing. If they would go 20 miles further south in Cass County, I'm sure there'd be some people out there. A few, I bet there would be. A few hundred people upset, but not yeah. the 15 or 20,000 that are upset now. They, the, I believe the people developing this landfill have bought 29 acres so far for a uh, for million dollars or a little over. But it's worth more than that. Before the threat of the landfill, the land was listed for more money than that. So they can get their money back if this landfill threat goes away. 
but there is, there is a cre in uh, Creekmore and, and Lee Summit, there's just a lot of people out there that are terrified that this is coming in and, I, I'm glad, and, and they have a right to be that way. When I first went to the Senate in 17, if you remember, Valley Oaks out in Lone Jack, they were talking about expanding a CAFO out there to a Class A, I believe, up to uh, 8,000 or 9,000 animal units. You've been consistent on this. You did vote for it. And it was, but the thing was there, the problem was uh, the, the state law is real clear. And if you check all the boxes, you go to get your, your CAFO. Uh, this is a little bit different because uh, I haven't researched yet and figured out why in 1986 there's a state law that says uh, in Jackson County only it's a state law but it only applies to Jackson County uh, they have to have a one half mile buffer to Lee Summit and Raymore uh, we're trying to expand that to a mile because that would give them a little more room so I have little doubt you could get this bill passed I don't know if I can you've got a wingman on this in New Bratton he's got a little more caustic uh, approach in the state Senate I'm not sure how many of your colleagues actually care about this, but I think they care about their bills being jammed up. Can you really pass this with your co-pilot? I don't know. I've, I've talked to people. I've brought some folks up here and toured it. Mm -hmm. uh, I've shown them around. Hopefully they have a better understanding of it. I think until we get down there and see, I don't know, <laughs> but uh, I'm hoping. Down there and see what? How Senator Bratton's going to approach session? I'm just going to work with my colleagues <laughs> and hopefully, and what is, I didn't realize this quite as strongly last year because I thought we were trying to change the state law that applied to the entire state. We're not. This is just a Jackson County law. And so it seems to me if I've got all the Jackson County senators wanting to do this, it should be something that people around the state would say, you know, that's their neck of the woods. Maybe we'll let them figure this out. So uh, let's talk about an issue that's going to come right to you. Another one of your colleagues, Senator O'Laughlin, has, um, She's had some opinions on this time of use billing that's being changed. She does. Uh, Evergy, KCPNL, is how I've always knew them. They did not want to do this change. It's some environmentalists that are pushing a new way to do things. The Public Service Commission went along with the environmentalists against the against the energy company. So, folks, the bills are going to go up, right? And she's not potentially, happy. Potentially, yeah, potentially. I mean, they they say that most bills will go down. I don't know that I believe that. And what is? Well, they're what, willing to put that in writing. <laughs> well, that well, that's and what who's I don't pick understand. Because the they say between four and eight, I think, is when the time of use kicks in the higher rates. They give you a number. They say it could go up to 30, 38 cents per kilowatt hour versus the ten or twelve that it normally is. But they won't tell you on the downside out of those hours how much you'll you'll spend. So it's hard for me to understand how you can pay three or four times what you're paying now for four hours a day, how are you going to make it up in the other 20 hours of the day? Well, since the state of Missouri is monkeying with your electric bill, should the state of Missouri pick up the tab if they're wrong? Uh, I, that would be interesting, but I don't think we'll do that. This is not Evergy monkeying with your electric no, bill. No, it's not. It's the state of that's, Missouri. that's the unfortunate part. Evergy's getting blamed for it. And I think that you know, a lot of parts of the country have done, have done it something along the time of use plan, but you have to opt in. And if you don't opt in, you don't have to do don't that. Don't you think that had been such a smarter that way to go That would have been a much better way to do it. I mean, if we were I sitting see. having supper and mm -hmm. you told me, hey, I've saved 50 bucks mm -hmm. a month on my electric bill. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm cheap. I'm going to get right on my computer when I get home and do the same thing you're doing. But when you force me, and I wonder, I'm not very often sitting when the government tells you something's going to be cheaper. Mm -hmm. If I have to bet, it's going to be more expensive. Well, I think it might be cheaper for people with electric cars, but most people that have electric cars are affluent people. They're not middle class working people for the most part. There's a few, but most of the most of the electric car vehicles are, are being purchased by pretty affluent people. And that's who they're targeting for. They're thinking of the future, encouraging people to charge their cars overnight. But if you had that, you can opt in. They could still do that. One of the PSC members that owns an electric car voted against it, Senator Holzman. Okay. Let's talk about schools. Another mm -hmm. issue, almost like this landfill. Mm -hmm. I watched schools when you're in the house. Uh, the issue clunked along for a very long time when you got involved. You've got a way about you that brings people together. Um, been a lot of talk on different ways to go about uh, improving schools. Uh, I think maybe there's some parents that maybe feel like they should, use, should be a little bit more respected. What is something that you feel like you could bring colleagues together and put together a package? I'm sure it won't be the huge thing everybody wants, but what is something that you think you could pass next year? Uh, next year, I don't know because I've had I've stubbed my toes so many times on this issue. It's and tough. We've got it through the House and Senate uh, back in 14, 15, and then the Governor Nixon vetoed it. So uh, there's a lot of ways to kill things down there. I would love. I, I, what I've always said is I'm trying to do something that empowers people to do what's best for their kids, because you don't know better than what their the parents do, and and especially down in the inner city of Kansas City and St. Louis. We, they've got parents down there that had their kids are in schools that are failing. They've been failing for decades. 
and just they just want a, a chance to put them someplace else. There, Kansas City and St. Louis has got a lot of closed Catholic schools. That right now there's a prohibition about that. But I think the Supreme Court, there's a state, I don't, I don't have all the details, but I believe it's called the Bowling Amendment. I believe it's being challenged and it may be overturned. That would allow states to directly to fund those schools. And I don't know what the problem with that, giving, a, giving parents. Now, I know you can't do the local effort because you got taxes, you got bonding to pay off, you got all that. And I don't, I'm not sure I want my neighbor's property taxes going to some other school district or some other uh, private school in another part of the town or state. But the state effort, the state part of that, I think should certainly uh, be given to the parents with the ability to put it in the in the school system they want. That would allow, because we can't just say everybody can go to Lee Summit or Blue Spring schools because they're good schools, because the, uh, my taxpayers don't want to pay. Well, you have the be, same problems eventually. Yeah, yeah but you just don't want everybody to overcrowd the schools. But taking up, uh, to bringing par private schools into that mix, I think there's a, like Lee Summit Christian School, they're willing to take what we did with the tax credit thing as full scholarships, because they've got money to, uh, to help those kids go. So for the money that we can give them now with the tax credit program, they can go lead some at Christian school. We need dozens of schools doing that. Senator Zerpoint, look forward to watching the session unfold and watching your role, and it looks like you're going to be at the center of a lot. Okay, thank you very much. We'll be right back. Representative Dan Howe joining for State Senate's our guest after this. For more than a century, the St. Louis Carpenters Union has shaped our communities. Through trusted alliances, we deliver skilled professional craftspeople while our business partners provide the kind of quality jobs that keep our economy humming. It's a blueprint that has worked since 1882. Turning Missouri into a right-to-work state stalls progress, wipes out jobs, and kills momentum. Right-to-work is wrong for everyone. Let's keep Missouri moving forward. Visit carpdc.org to learn more. Thanks for joining us. Justice and Journalism with Judge Mike Carter. What I'd like to do is bring facts and circumstances from around the metro area with some local politicos, charitable causes, and let you decide for yourself if you like what's going on. I'm in this for public service. 400 qualified jurors in some of the rural counties are actually really hard to find. When you're talking about low-level, nonviolent offenders, when you put them in jail, you increase the likelihood that they turn into a serious offender. Justice and Journalism with me, Judge Mike Carter. Data captured by our state-of-the-art monitors helps us pinpoint the timing and location of severe weather more accurately and respond to trouble more quickly. Ameren, Missouri's investment in smart technologies like this is one way we're improving reliability and restoring power faster than ever. Responding to trouble before trouble hits. That's energy at work. Ameren, Missouri. Welcome back to this week in Missouri politics from our beautiful studios here on the campus of the University of Central Missouri in Warrensburg, Missouri. Welcoming in Representative Dan Alex. Representative, you're making some news. You're going to represent it, right? I am. Thanks for having me. Yep, for the uh, Senate District 31 over in it'll be Johnson, Cass, and Bates County. Now, running for a rep in your hometown, I mean, now that it's not a challenging thing, but running for Senate's a much bigger task to bite off. What made you jump in the race? Well, you know, I, I feel that we need some effective conservative leadership over in the Senate. I feel I'm that guy. Uh, you know, the past couple of years have been very frustrating to me, you know, the, uh, the book club, so to speak. Uh, <laughs> you know, we're afraid to move forward and get some stuff done for the state. Well, it is, the, the, the chambers are very different. I mean, you do pass a lot of things in the House. The Senate's kind of meant to slow things down. Uh, lately, they've really slowed things down, right? Screeching halt. <laughs> it, I can see the frustration, but also, do you see some of the value in that some of the things that, maybe some of the things you pass in the House is fine to theoretically raise the issue or whatever, but man, it becomes state law. Uh, some of the stuff that doesn't come to a vote, uh, there's a value to the Senate though, right? There is a value to the Senate. You know, having the deliberative body, it's, uh, it's there, it serves its purpose. That's what our founding father set it up to do. But now let's take a step back here. You guys, we had veto session this week. We did. Um, I think it became, well, actually I tweeted out a quote from the Senate Appropriations Chairman that he would not be taking up veto overrides. You guys went ahead and veto overrided some stuff. Uh, it's almost like you were the book club uh, this week, right? Yeah, definitely were. You know, I mean, I'm not a big believer in veto overrides, uh, but unfortunately, you know, there were some that some people were passionate about. So, I one, mean, it is. One it is. Would have sent them home with a win. But they didn't, right? No, well, I mean, I guess it's a pyrrhic victory, maybe. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Because I. I'll to go me, with that. You're sitting in caucus, right? What's the point of having a veto override when you can read right on the internet that the <clears> appropriation says, <throat> "I'm not doing this." I think his quote to me was. We're not doing any of that. Right. I mean, I would have rather gaveled in, gaveled out, and been home at yep. 1 yesterday afternoon, not 4.30. The public would have been safe, right? Yeah. It was an interesting thing, though. You had some senators 
who voted against the budget bills, complaining that Governor Parson had cut the, bu cut the budget, but they were upset that he cut the budget that affected them. It was like, don't tax me, tax the man behind that tree, right? Right, when, then when you don't vote for the bill in the beginning either. You like he's no trying to agree it. with you, right? right? And you won't take the yes for an answer. Let's talk about a big issue that I, I assume, I know was a big issue at the end of session. I know it's a big issue that you're involved in, and I have to predict if there's one of four or five issues that'll be a big issue next session. It's a landfill. Now, it's, it's not quite going in Cass County. It's going right on the Cass County, Jackson County line, correct? Correct. But it affects a ton of folks in northern Cass County, which would be your Senate district, right? Correct. It, you know, Raymore, Belton area, uh, there's a great subdivision there, Creedmoor. Uh, beautiful homes mm -hmm. uh, with the landfill going in right next is just going to tank their values of their home. So. Okay, but re the Republican Party is the party of property rights, correct? It's a proper, I do what I want with my property. The government doesn't tell me what to do. I make my own decisions. Um, if you've bought land and you want to sell it to a landfill, a bowling alley, a Starbucks, is it really the government's business if you read the Republican Party platform to tell you what to do with your own land? Well, as far as platform, no. But in this case, uh, it's just in a terrible location. What they're trying to do with elementary schools within a three-mile radius, I think there's seven of them, these homes, churches, everything that you don't want to have a landfill around. They've got a great grassroots efforts over there, and they're doing tremendous things, really getting the word out. And, you know, I think it's going to be a difficult thing for them to get the landfill uh, in that spot. All right. I've met some of those folks, good folks. Put the devil's advocate for a second, though. Where do you stop? I mean, if you're just going to continue to tell folks what to do with their own property, I mean, at some point, is it the state's business to get involved? And this landfill hasn't really been a secret. It's been coming for a while now. Why jump in now? Well, I think it's just having that grassroots efforts now. There's so many people behind it. I'm behind them. Why had it been done before then? It finally got rolling this time around in this particular landfill. You know, there's one going in Pettis County out in the middle of nowhere. People are still upset about it. Sure. And it is in the middle of nowhere as far as Pettis County goes. But also, Pettis County only has, I think, eight years left in their landfill. So are you saying if you were a state senator, you could get it passed? I could get it passed. How do you know that? Just got to negotiate. <laughs> Let's talk about a guy that's a master negotiator that's kind of been a, had a bad run, Donald Trump. Now, you know, I think he lost his election. Unfortunately, you know, I, I've always been a Republican. I don't make any bones about that. I wish the guy I voted for would have won, but he didn't yeah, win. Right. And I've, I've really always kind of turned my ear up about folks who I don't believe most people think he won that election. I think some folks pander to folks. I don't think they think he actually won. And, however, and I, I kind of got tired of him whining about losing when he, he lost. But when you start arresting him every other day, I'm like, no, wait a minute. That doesn't seem right either. No, and, and you know, should Hillary Clinton have been arrested? See, I think that Donald Trump... You know, you talk about Donald Trump not being a statesman, and I, there's plenty of evidence for that. But he didn't put his political opponent in jail. And Joe Biden, to me, comes off like a great statesman. And he hasn't stopped people in his administration, under his name, from putting his political opponent in jail. Well, I don't think he knows where he's at. So, uh, but that's in my yeah. opinion. But, you know, I think with Trump, how Trump lost the election was the rhetoric. People just got sick of hearing the rhetoric of just, you know, well, if I just dis disagree with you, I'm just going to call you something different. Well, you're, you're a rhino now. Wait a second. I voted on the public platform, but now I'm a rhino? Well, it's also Donald Trump. Do you really believe Donald Trump like his pro-life? Now, to his credit, he, he appointed judges, and they passed a major, they overturned Roe versus Wade. Right. Um, do I believe Donald Trump is a down-the-line Republican? No, not at all. I think Donald Trump's an excellent politician, maybe the best one we've ever seen in this country. Um, and I, but I do think, you know, in, in politics, you have, a, you have a, a run you can make. And I think folks didn't get ready for a change. Yeah. And I think Donald Trump's coalition has stuck together surprisingly well, frankly, for a candidate that's lost. But I think he would have been so much better off knocking off the complaining about losing. But I, I still say, whatever his chances were for being president of the United States again, they're higher now after they've arrested him 15 times. Oh, yeah. In 91 indictments. Four indictment, 91 charges, sorry. I, yeah, run up out of an old boy at Knob Noster. I just think it strikes him, okay, did Donald Trump keep some records he shouldn't have kept? If I had to guess, probably so. Was he being a jerk? If it's Donald Trump, it probably was. But Joe Biden had some records, right? In the back of a car. Yeah, I mean, you know, and he's got a kid that's, that's kind of squirrely. And I, I just think that, it, you know, at some point, somebody should have stepped in and said, this is not good for this country. Well, before, nobody did. I, before I came on the show here today, they just indicted Hunter Biden 
on charges. And, you know, to me, a kid's one thing, but you really break down, did, did, did that need to happen? Is the country better off? And also, you know, you could probably, I think the Republicans have created this Department of Justice that they've totally lost control of. Oh, yeah. I mean, if I they're agree. too powerful, they, pretty much if they don't like you, they'll get you. And yeah. you could shoot off all the fireworks you want. If the federal government wants to put you in jail, they'll bankrupt you and put you in jail. And right. they will. You can't really do much about it. It'll be the, on the bankruptcy part. The, exactly. sm the small government conservatives have created a police state. It's just they're very selective in who the, they, they go after. Right. But they're going after Donald Trump right now. I mean, Donald Trump may have the ability to get around it, but I think your old boy at Knob Noster, who probably believed a U.S. attorney and believed the FBI at their word, I think there's a lot of folks in this country that are saying, you know, wait a minute here. You're doing this. This just doesn't smell right. I wonder what else you're doing. Yeah. The smell test is definitely not passing. I mean, what do you think? What do you hear just from folks out in Warrensburg and as you get around the Senate district? I, I think there's a lot of folks that were just kind of wore out with Trump and were ready to look for somebody else. I mean, DeSantis, his COVID record in Florida or whatever, whatever you're going for. I just think this brought him back. And if you didn't like Trump, theoretically, that's what you didn't want, right? Right. And I, it's given a tremendous amount of power right now. Politically capital, he's all up. It's, his poll numbers are still staying strong. Yeah. So, uh, you know, he could very well be the, uh, the person. So let's talk about this initiative petition. You guys in the House tried to change the way people put initiative petitions on the ballot. Right. Couldn't quite come to some agreements here with the Senate. And, and that's one where I, I, I think it wasn't just the Senate book club. I think there was some, it's very hard. Everybody wants to do IP reform. Right. But like, tell me what you want to pick. And then everybody's going to want to do a different IP reform. The, the pro-choice folks, after Roe versus Wade, it feels to me like, you tell me if I'm wrong, maybe your average Missourian isn't quite where the new law is. So they want to change it with the IP. Do you feel like the law that you voted for is where your average Missourian is on abortion? I don't, and just because I've heard it from people. You know, they, they did not like the uh, incest. Hmm? They did not like the rape part of it. So those two, those are the big main ones I hear about what, what they didn't like. And it seems like we're probably gonna have abortion on the 24 ballot. You know, everybody will be able to vote on it. Even if we do get some type of initiative petition done next year with an emergency clause and whether it has to deal with the congressional districts or just a flat 55, 56% or 60%, uh, I still believe that abortion will still be on the ballot. You know, and to me though, it looks like the pro-choice folks, they're not just going a little far, they're going real far. And I'm not, I mean, I think an IP could pass by a significant amount if it was constrained and, and maybe cautious. It looks like they've got some that are pretty aggressive. Uh, and if you have more than one, it, I think this is just a microcosm of why whatever your position is, you know, everybody thinks there should be a change in this process. You know, I think the people at Right to Life do a good job what they're trying to do, yeah. but I think they've got out of their lane this past couple of years. You know, obviously they grade legislators uh, and grading us on a map boat. Well, that's not your lane. Your, your lane is protecting life. It just seems like an odd thing there. It, it has been a little funny. I mean, I've watched uh, some of the, the endorsements, even the one for governor, right? Yeah. Uh, oh. You know, you say what you will about Bill Igle. I mean, Bill Igle has been there bleeding and fighting for pretty much every single thing they've even conceptualized. Right. Uh, and has a voting record. Yeah, and it's not that Jay Ashcroft probably doesn't have the same views as Bill Igle or, and ones that, that they support, but it does seem as though some of these things are not exactly uh, abortion related. They're, 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 it seems like there's a ripple or two out from that. Right. Um, does that, is that over time, is that gonna matter? I mean, if, if, this, if, this, if one of these initiative petition passes, I think you open up a whole nother stream of abortion bills, correct? I think you do too. Um, let's talk about taxes in the state. Yeah. You in the House have talked about cutting taxes. We have cut taxes. We've lowered the tax burden on Missouri citizens uh, four years ago. The triggers have gone in effect. Your taxes you're paying in the state are lower. Now that you've cut taxes, let's talk about guns. Uh, lots of folks talk about the cities have now decided, and I, it's kind of interesting uh, exercise in federalism. They think you've went too far with letting more people have guns. Now they're stepping up and saying, we're gonna ban assault rifles. I got a great email from a guy telling me I'm assault, assault rifle's not a machine gun. I'm gonna take him in his word for that. But if we were setting it, um, if we were setting down the plaza, right? And we saw a guy walking by with an AR. That's a little weird, isn't it? It is definitely weird, you know. Uh, I've seen it in other cities, haven't seen yeah. it in Missouri. Uh, you know, kind of, you know, you do that double take. But, you know, we, we kept our Second Amendment rights here in the state. Uh, open carry, which was passed seven, eight years ago, if I remember right. Uh, so, and, you, you know, it's our right. It's underneath our Constitution. 
See, that's Second where I'm Amendment's almost right thinking there. maybe where, where people are. Um, it's weird, but I guess if it's your right to walk around with an assault rifle, it's also my right to keep an eye on you, right? Yeah. I mean, like, it what's that your... guy doing over there? That's yeah. kind of weird. Um, I can't let you leave when we talk about the issue you champion, which is sports betting. Yes. It is just bizarre to me. Now, we'd have all lost our shirts betting on that Chiefs Detroit game, but, uh, but it is bizarre that the party that talks about small government wants to tell you whether you can put 10 bucks on the Chiefs. Right. You've been the champion of this. You've passed it through the House how many times now? Three. And the Senate hasn't quite been able to close the deal there. Um, number one, they're using the initiative petition process, correct? Yes. They filed four initiative petitions, four initiative petitions uh, this past week. So they're going to try just like I'm trying in the House with something. Take it to the vote of the people. If we can't get it done in the legislature, they have the right to take it to the vote of the people. So you're going to come back this year? Because, I mean, the truth is, I think the sports teams are willing to allow a pretty generous amount of the, of this revenue to go back to the state. Yes. But in the initiative petitions, they probably aren't going to be so generous, right? Uh, you know, the ones that I've looked at just briefly, I haven't had time, we've been down in Jeff City, uh, they were very common to my bill as far as the tax rate, you know, the, the, the 10 to 15 percent. So, and they're the paying fees that are realistic fees to have the license. So tell me, um, currently you have, your proposal has the support of the Chiefs and the Cardinals, right? Correct, and the Blues. Have and you the ever seen anything tournament? in the state of Missouri if the Chiefs and the Cardinals are both for, didn't pass? No. So do you think with the, with the thought of the folks, I mean, imagine being able to go vote for Nolan Arenado and Patrick Mahomes. Do you think it'll help you leverage uh, passing something in the legislature this year? I mean, I think it definitely does help because, you know, we're stingy. We want it done our way, not your way. Mm -hmm. So I think it definitely does help. And we'll see, you know, as we get closer to session, I'll talk with Senator Hoskins more about it and, you know, Maybe there's some common ground, but I'll keep on doing what I do with the bill. Yeah, it's got to be a little awkward seeing him at the gas station or at Walmart, and you're trying to pass your version, he's trying to pass his. Do you ever, like, while you're, you know, buying grapes or something, say, hey, why don't you just let mine go this time? Well, I've said it, but uh, <laughs> actually said it, yeah, we talked about it yesterday briefly. All right, before we go, give me a who won the week. Well, I'm going to go back to the sports IP initiative. Bill DeWitt, the owner of the Cardinals, has been a champion of this. It's under him. He, he's been working on these uh, all summer long after we were unable to do it. So I believe he won the week. Yeah, I do think it adds an element of it's not just theoretical now. It's They are going to the ballot. And if uh, you don't figure it out next year by May, I think the voters may help you all out by August, right? Right. And I think also in the legislator wise, John Patterson, the new speaker elect. You know, he he's, he reminds me a little bit of you. He's, he's grown up with a job. He runs a cool engine. Uh, the state's in pretty good hands there with him, right? I believe so. I am going to say, uh, Governor Mike Parson, he has never had a veto that's been overridden, and he's batting a thousand from that, and that, that streak continued this week. So I'll say Governor Parson won the week. Hope you'll win the week by coming back here next week and joining us this week in Missouri Politics. This Week in Missouri Politics is sponsored by the Missouri Automobile Dealers Association, Ameren, Spire, and the United Electric Cooperative.